Howdy everyone, I'm Dan McGrath. I'm the product manager for Cloud Data Store and my co-presenter today is Will. Will is one of the software engineers on the team. So anytime I'm wrong, he can correct me because he actually writes the code. Yeah, like I go by they, not he, so. Sorry. That's okay. Just talking about corrections. Yes, <laughs> perfect. Thanks, Will. All right, so today, I'm going to talk to you about how you would go and write scalable applications on top of Cloud Data Store. I'm going to run through some of the information. Uh, I'll start off with a quick overview on Cloud Data Store, just tell you what it is, and then run through some of the common architectures we advise our customers on. Uh, from there, we'll talk a little bit about data models, and I'll go into some of the internals of the system and how we lay things out down in the storage layer and the implications of that. Before we move on to just a quick touch on load testing and performance testing. But to kick it off, I wanted to give you some background on the types of tasks you spend time on traditionally when writing applications. Planning for the unknown is something that's always hard and full of guesses. One of the things that you'll be working on as you approach your launch date will be tasks like capacity planning and provisioning for your application and database software. How big do you need to make your VMs? How many nodes do you need to provision to handle your estimated traffic load? How much storage do you need? What about networking, connecting it all together? How do you provision that? There's a tenuous balance you would traditionally strike between making sure you have enough capacity available to handle that expected load and not having too much that you're wasting money on hardware that you're not going to use. There's also operational aspects you'll be working on as well. When you get to your launch day, how would you add more capacity if you end up being way larger than you're expecting? Or once you've launched and you start gaining traction and growing, how do you grow capacity in a more organic manner? The other part of this operational aspect is working out how you would roll out updates to the application as well as the database software itself without having downtime. The other thing you'd end up spending a bunch of time on is making sure that you're using your database in a way that scales. The last thing that you want to find out when you launch your application is you have a bunch of queries that run in super linear time compared to the data set. Queries can quickly degenerate from taking milliseconds to seconds, which ends up being a very large problem when you need to rethink your database model and then rebuild the database to fix it. All of this is essentially wasted time that you could be spending on actually writing your application and not spending time on fixing and configuring your application's infrastructure. So I'm definitely not here to tell you I can solve all these problems, but hopefully I can give you some insight in how you could use Cloud Data Store and how you could architect on top of it to minimize most of these problems. So let's start off with a quick overview of what Cloud Data Store is. I know some people in this room may have not heard of it, about it before. So within the Google Cloud Platform, we have a portfolio of managed database and storage solutions. As GCP's NoSQL database for user-facing data, you'd typically see Cloud Data Store used for mobile and web applications rather than, say, traditional corporate back-end systems or something like Internet of Things device data. Now, there are always gray areas where multiple database and storage solutions will be right for your application. As a general rule, though, answering some of these questions can be a shortcut to understand whether Cloud Data Store is a solution for you or perhaps some other solution. So the first thing you want to ask yourself, are you dealing with semi-structured or structured data? Are you doing something that's more transactional in nature rather than analytical and running reports? And can you get away with not doing complex joins on your live data? If you answered yes to all of this, 
then it's a pretty good probability that Cloud Data Store is a great solution for you. Now, Cloud Data Store is a document-oriented database that's been used in production by our customers and Google itself for over eight years now. Its real strong point is being in a fast, fully managed solution that will scale from zero to millions of requests per second without you changing any configuration, worrying about adding nodes, and without any downtime to add this extra capacity. It literally scales from handling your workload on a single machine to 10,000 of machines without you doing anything. What's really beautiful about it is under this operational simplicity is a really sophisticated, synchronously replicated database. We currently give you two flavors of replication you can choose depending on the location that you select. Regional locations operate a multi-zone replicated system, whereas our multi-region locations are not just multi-zone, but also multi-region, where we replicate across distinct geo-regions. Typically, we would see people picking a regional location when they want to co-locate it with, say, a compute instance they already have in that particular location, or they're exceptionally sensitive to write latencies. Uh, if you're looking for something that's more durable and can survive regional outages, that's where we see the majority of our customers picking this multi-region solution. Uh, for you, operationally, there's no difference. It's simply a different selection in a drop-down list. Now, I wanted to give you a quick visual example. Uh, this is fairly simplified of what our replication topology looks like uh, in one of our multi-region locations. So this is US Central, where we run two full replicas in Oklahoma, two full replicas in Iowa, and we also have what we call a witness to act as a tiebreaker in South Carolina. Now, to connect all these together, we run three independent fiber optic networks so that we can have a network down for maintenance. We can have another one unexpectedly out, like someone goes through it with a backhoe. Unfortunately, that does sometimes happen. And still continue to serve full production load without you noticing anything. The question was, are the two replicas that I showed in each region in different zones? And the answer is essentially yes. The last point in this quick overview on Cloud Data Store that I wanted to give you is, before we jump down into some of the more technical aspects, is talking about the key integration points within the Cloud Platform. So obviously, you can connect to it from any of our compute services, whether it's App Engine or Container Engine. Uh, we allow you to do exports of your data into Cloud Storage buckets and import it back in. These same export formats can be imported into BigQuery as well. So if you want to do a daily dump of your data and then run SQL statements over it in a data warehouse solution, you can do that. The other one I really wanted to point out is the integration with Cloud Dataflow, or Apache Beam. This will allow you to do fan outs of reads and write across the database in parallel, and is a really powerful way to integrate into the rest of the platform. With that quick overview out of the way, Let's go and have a look at some common architectures that we see our customers using with Cloud Data Store. So to start off, I'm going to show an example here of a more traditional corporate system. Uh, here, what we're seeing is a couple of compute VMs that connect into Cloud Data Store, each handling a different system. As an example, it could be a sign-in system and maybe a product catalog. What's really good about this for the sign-in system is that it's typically a spiky load. So most of the time, your database would be sitting there at 90% idle over the week, hardly being used except for a couple of peak times. In Cloud Data Store, we only charge you for the actual usage, the calls to the database itself, not for having capacity sit around. This is really handy because over the weekend, you're not paying for capacity you're not using. And when the sign-ins start to roll in begrudgingly on Monday morning, we'll automatically scale the system up to handle that load spike and then go back to normal levels during the week. 
The other thing I'm just showing down the bottom, which I briefly mentioned before, is doing a daily export into cloud storage, which then gets imported into BigQuery so people can run daily reports over it. And then you can use standard SQL query languages to generate your reports that the business needs. So with the Compute Engine example, that was a traditional system. Now I want to quickly show you an example using Container Engine, which is uh, one of the many configurations we see people doing things like mobile gaming platforms. So what you're seeing here is pods set up as a series of microservices. Between the pods and the users is Google Cloud, Lab, Google Cloud Load Balancer to distribute the traffic between the different pods. The first line of pods are player front ends. So a player will have an affinity to a particular pod so you can cache the data for them for low latency serving. The next line of microservice pods behind that, uh, you could consider a world backend. Now these particular pods have an affinity to an area in the game world, a particular match, or a level that a player is playing. So once again, you can cache state that is local to that particular aspect of the game, so you can have low latency. What you then have is durably writing that state data down to data store, so you don't have to worry about the pods going down, and you can cycle new pods up to take care of everything. The last quick example here of an architecture we see is using App Engine as this fully managed, scalable web app. You'll notice here we don't have Google Cloud Load Balancer because that's an automatic feature of App Engine. We're also using App Engine modules to have isolation between the different microservices so you can handle them independently. A little bit different here is a module in App Engine that we're showing writing directly into BigQuery rather than using the daily import and export. This is essentially a dual write model for someone who wants to have live, da live data in their data warehouse. Uh, for bigger deployments, you'll typically see people put in cloud PubSub in between the module and BigQuery so they can effectively handle large amounts of loads being streamed into various BigQuery tables. OK. so. Let's go a little bit deeper now and start talking about how you would lay out your data in Cloud Data Store. First, a quick note on some of the basic building blocks you have available and some of the terminology that we use, because it's a little bit different than you'd normally see. In Cloud Data Store, you can think of what we call an entity as essentially a document or a table row. What we call a kind is sort of like a collection or a table, just a little bit more powerful. Now, there's a standard list of data types you can use, everything from integers to blobs. There's also slightly more complex types you can use, arrays or embedded entities, where Im embedded entities are essentially just a map. You can also control data locality using hierarchies, something that we call entity groups. Now, this particular feature, entity groups, has implications on consistency and write throughput which we'll touch upon now. Strong consistency enables you ha to have multiple applications or people see a consistent view of a database in a particular time. This is really important in distributed databases for a variety of use cases. As an example, if you have a social network inside, you don't want to have a user delete post P, add friend F, and then have that friend see the post that they just deleted about their surprise party because of eventual consistency. So there's definitely a strong requirement for this in certain areas. There are also other areas where strong consistency isn't as needed. For example, if you're trying to do a population count across the US, if you're off by a couple of births, it doesn't really make a difference. What you might be looking for then instead is having an ability to have fast and scalable writes across a large data set. So eventual consistency can allow you to do that. A quick cheat to think about this as we go through a bit more of this presentation is to remember that 
indexes in Cloud Data Store are eventually consistent, whereas directly reading the entity is always strongly consistent. The one difference here is if you use something we call ancestor queries that contain it to a single entity group, that also forces it to be strongly consistent. So how you lay out your data, how you query or read it, allows you to sort of tune and select the consistency versus the right throughput. When we consult with customers who are writing very large scale applications on Cloud Data Store, I'll generally start off with three main questions to walk through to start helping them understand how to lay out their data model. The first one is understanding the queries that you want to run across your data. Cloud Data Store forces you to use queries that will scale by the size of your result set, not by the size of your data set. So what that means is if you have a query that returns 10 entities, it will take the same time to execute whether you have 100 entities in your database or 100 million entities in your database. Um, that does mean we disallow certain types of queries, though, to make sure that you're only using queries at scale. The second question we ask them is understanding when your traffic increase, how does your write profile change? So we have some guideline limits within the system. We have people sort of consider when they're building it, which helps understand whether you build things into entity groups or spread it out wider and use eventual consistency. The first one is if you're updating individual entities, you want to try to keep it to updating that entity only once per second. So an example of where you might think about that is if you're trying to do a counter. Doing a counter for every person signing into your system when you have 100 million concurrent users is generally not a good idea in any database. Uh, there are things you can consider, like sharded counters, that will split those updates across a variety of entities so you can effectively increase your write throughput. The second limit is around the data entity group, sorry, the entity group itself. Uh, that also has a one transaction per second write guideline that we have. Now, I said transaction, not write because you can have multiple entities within a transaction. You can batch hundreds of entities together, and that con gets considered as one, one write transaction. So you can do hundreds of entities per second into that group, but you have to make sure you batch it appropriately. The next one, uh, in terms of guideline limits when looking at how your writes scale with your traffic, is any place you might have monotonically increasing or decreasing keys. Uh, the way our system splits or shards our data and then splits the servers that handle it uh, means that we can sustain about 500 writes per second on sequential data. We'll see in a second how we lay out indexes on disk, uh, but the essential implication of this is the same thing applies for sequential data. So if you're trying to index a particular property that is the timestamp now, you want to keep your writes per second on that particular kind under 500 per second. Now, when you keep that in mind, um, it is worth noting you can do a million writes per second or more across the entire database as long as you have your data set up appropriately. It's also good to note here a general rule if you've ever talked to our SRE team that works on Cloud Data Store is what they like to call the 555 rule. This is when you're ramping up traffic for the first time with writes. You want to look at starting at a base write rate of 500 writes per second, increasing it by 50% every five minutes. So using that type of ramp up model, you can get to about 700,000 writes per second in under 90 minutes. But it's just important to have that constant ramp up profile uh, to make sure that we split the system and scale up appropriately. The last question that we ask is about consistency guarantees that you need. Just remembering that lookups and ancestor queries are strongly consistent, and other queries that use indexes are eventually consistent. So I'm going to dive into the weeds for just a second here, just to give you an example of where understanding what type of query you're doing can change how you lay out your data. So just for a second, let's suppose you have an employee system that wants to store the start and end times of someone's shift 
over the week. The first way you might think about doing this is storing two arrays of start times and the appropriate end times. Uh, noting from the previous side, the types of queries we support are multiple equality filters, multiple equality filters with one inequality filter, but we don't support two inequality filters on different properties. So if you think that we have one array of start times, one array of end times, you'd have to do two inequality filters on different properties, which doesn't actually scale for very large loads. You could change how you do your data, though, and instead of storing start time and end times, break the day up into 30-minute periods and then store each 30-minute block that that person is on shift. Now, if you account for the day of the week in that, that changes your two inequality filters to a single equality filter, which is a very scalable model. So just below the data model here is just a small snippet of JavaScript that shows you how you'd convert the time into 30-minute blocks. And then the query itself is very simple. You just use our query builder in Java, set the kind to employees, and then filter by that 30-minute block that you're looking for. And you can find everyone who's on shift right now and invite them to the pizza party. Another example is, what if you're writing a game review site? How would you lay out your data to do reviews on games? So obviously, here you would start off with a table or a kind called games, and you give it a bunch of data, some auto ID as the primary key. You'd have a string for the game name and description. You might have a link to an image within GCS for the title or cover art. How would you lay out the reviews? Well, one option here that enforces strong consistency is to use those entity groups we mentioned before. So within your review, where you have a rating and the user who submitted it, uh, you would set an ancestor key for the game itself. And this would force it into the same location on the server, and then you can do strongly consistent queries against it. Generally, that would work well. But if you're trying to launch a really large scale game, and you're worried about the number of new reviews per second exceeding one write per second, into that entity group for the game, you might need to think about using your data model a little bit differently. So uh, just a quick disclaimer on that one write transaction. That, as I said, it's more like a guideline. So you can definitely burst above that to like 30 writes per second for short periods of time. Eventually, if you keep a high write rate, though, you'll exhaust our internal queues in the system. At that point, we'll start rejecting the new write you do with essentially a rate limit. Uh, but you can burst above it. But say you're concerned that a new game is going to be super popular. I don't know, maybe you're running around the world catching these little critters in an AR game. I don't know what that would be. It sounds like a good idea, though. So if you're doing that, you're probably going to end up with more than one game review per second for an extended period of time. So instead of doing this ancestor group model, you can choose the second model I've shown here, where we change it up a little bit. We actually store the game ID as a regular property that gets indexed. So now I can do a query that's eventually consistent, but I can do as many writes as I want, because they're not in entity groups. That generally works really well for game reviews, except for one edge case, which can be really jarring. And that's when a user writes a review, goes to the game list, and doesn't see their own review. That's a pretty bad experience. So what we've done here to get around it is a little bit of a cheat to make it look like it's strongly consistent. And the ID, instead of being an auto ID, is actually the combination of the game ID and the user ID. So now when you're generating your list of game reviews, you do your eventually consistent query to get all game reviews. And then you do a lookup on the game ID with the current user's ID. Because lookups are strongly consistent, you're always guaranteed to see that particular user's review. So now you have a write rate where you can have millions of reviews per second. And to any regular user, it's going to look like it's strongly consistent. OK, now time to go a little bit deeper. I want to share out how this data that we just talked about would actually be laid out on Datastore so you can understand what's happening under the hood. As you may or may not be aware, Cloud Datastore is built on top of Megastore and Bigtable. So if you want to read more about how the, some of the underlying infrastructure it works, we have research papers you can go read if you're um, interested in that sort of thing. 
Uh, Megastore and Bigtable are the two technologies we build on top of, and we add a bunch of functionality on top of that. So to start with here, we have sort of a primary table called entities where we store all the entities that you're writing into the database. That's generally structured where the key you provide us combined with your project ID, the namespace, the kind, all gets combined together as primary key. And then in each of the columns, we have all the data you've written. Now, Bigtable is a wide column store. We essentially just use it for a key value store here with the key and the data of your entity. And we also have a kind index, so we can query by that. Any of your secondary indexes, so anytime you index an individual property, we also write them out into their own column families. And the way we do that is we take the data of the property you're indexing and make that the key, combined with things like your project ID. And then the data, the value, is the key of the entity we're looking for. We also, for built-in properties, these secondary indexes, we index them by both ascending and descending order. So the thing to keep in mind there is anytime you turn on an index for a property, that's two index entries, one for ascending, one for descending. So moving on to the little more complex feature here where we have composite indexes. This is essentially where you say, I want to query using multiple properties within the data model. So you tell us to create a composite index of those particular properties. Uh, as you might have guessed from the previous one, the way we do that is we essentially just combine the two property values together and then have the value as the key as well. Now this one here, you have to tell us the sort order because we will do it ascending and descending for each property. And depending on the way you want to query it or the sort order that you use, we'll need to have a different index built for that. And then the third one here with my very bad illustration skills, you would see in property C, I've tried to indicate that there's an essentially an array there. We have three different values that we're storing in an array. When we create an index for an array, we explode it out and we create an index entry for every array value. This is something you need to keep in mind if you try to do a composite index on multiple properties that are indexes because you're going to have the cardinal property and it's going to explode. Two, two arrays of three properties is now nine index values. So you can very quickly end up with a large amount of indexes we're writing. This is important when you're doing any query that's eventually consistent. So as I mentioned before, queries are eventually consistent. Sorry, indexes are eventually consistent. And the amount of explosion of indexes you have per entity is going to affect how many milliseconds it takes us in the average case to bring that back to a, a strong, cons strongly consistent state. Now, I'm going to jump back to that entity table I mentioned before and just quickly highlight how we split up or shard the data to be served. Much like Bigtable, we essentially use horizontal row splitting to work out which server handles which range of data. So we'll do a horizontal range handled by a single server. As the load increases on any one of these servers that we call tablets, we'll essentially split that horizontal range in two and then have one server handle the left-hand side and another server handle the right-hand side. This goes back to what I talked about with the sequential data, the monotonically increasing and decreasing keys. So when you think about how we split the data, if you're sequentially adding data to the end of a table, when we split, we're going to have one server handle all the same amount of load, and the other server's going to handle no load. So that's why we don't generally like indexing sequential data. Uh, there is another case here, and that's when we're talking about a single key. So if you're trying to do a lot to a single key, it's very hard to shard a single key. In fact, I think it's impossible. Yes. <laughs> Alas. Uh, generally, that will lead to a quite sensible question that people ask next. What about low cardinality data? I have a property that's just true or false. Does that mean you can't scale by that data? Well, under the covers, we have a nifty little trick that we call a scatter key, which is a two-byte randomized value that we append to every value that we write, whether whether it's the primary key of your entity itself or the index data. What that means is every time we write data, if it's low cardinality, we will randomly distribute it so that we can adequately split on that data. 
that doesn't work for monotonically increasing or decreasing data because a random value at the end is always at the end, so it doesn't help us. And so with that, I'm going to move on to load testing, which is probably an important thing. Even though we're a fully managed solution, we'll automatically scale up and down for you. There are a lot of gotchas that when you're running at low scale, you may not realize you've inadvertently done. Sequential data is one of those examples. So when you're doing load testing, you're really looking for a couple of things here. And the key one here is hotspotting. So that's the example where we're talking about we can't split in the correct way to handle your data and we'll have a particular row uh, that may be hot um, that has brought down applications before where they're trying to do 100,000 reads from a single row, and unfortunately, a single server struggles to serve that. Uh, one thing to think about when you're talking about load testing is very different from the traditional on-prem problems you would have. So generally, when you're trying to do very large load tests with on-prem, you need to order hardware for it. And that can be very hard to justify spending enough hardware to bring your application to the point where it breaks. And you can understand where the stress points are in that application. When you're running in most of the cloud models, this can actually be very effective because you only pay for the resources when you're using it. With something like GCE, 10 minutes minimum for the VM, and then you pay by the minute, the moment you finish using it, you don't need to do it. So we've had customers on Cloud Data Store who, with our guidance because they're running at such large scales, will sit down and for an hour, they will do a 1 million request per second load test, a 2 million request per second load test, a 3 million request per second load test, and then they find a failure point in their algorithm where an N-squared algorithm finally hits them. It's not just Data Store you're looking at when you're doing load and performance testing as well. I specifically say performance, because latency can have really odd effects when you're talking about applications at scale. Uh, and this is sort of cascading failure that you'll typically see in large applications, where when you put a certain area of the system under load, it keeps up, but at higher latency. Something that took 10 milliseconds now takes 100, 200 milliseconds. And that causes the next part of the system to back up, which then adds load onto the next section. An example here would be if you're using PubSub to batch large amounts of writes together into an entity group. Generally, this is going along, and it's only writing 10 to 20 entities per second into an entity group. If the system slows down in being able to pull all these entities out, batch them together, and write them into the system, you might start seeing the batch size increase. So you're going from 10 to 20 entities per second being batched together to 100, 200 entities being written in a single batch. And we will keep up with that. At some point, you will get to the area where we have a 10 megabyte transaction limit. So all of a sudden, your application's going along. You don't see anything wrong. And then, bam, you hit a 10 megabyte per transaction limit, and your writes to data store stop. Now, it's not because any particular area wasn't keeping up, but this cascading effect that ended up with larger batches until it got to that critical point. So that's why whenever you're trying to launch something that's large and you haven't done it before, it's really important to stress the system beyond what you think the max is going to be. And then you can find these particular stress points and fix them before you're live in production, because that's definitely a more stressful time. Just a little bit. So with that, I'm going to hand off to Will, who will take you through a fun little demo. Hi, everyone. Um, Thanks, Dan, for that really awesome exploration of data store internals. Um, so don't get your hopes up. This is actually a really simple game, but what's the workshop about building scalable apps if it doesn't you know, actually include some sort of scalable app, right? Um, so we have a small example for you. It's rock, paper, scissors. You, you all so so excited. Uh, so. This is uh, especially, I mean, I don't know if you saw me off to the side earlier, uh, finishing up the last bit of JavaScript, which I haven't written in a very long time. Uh, this is more of a concept than something we've actually built out. But these components you can find in real life systems. One of the nice things about building on top of App Engine, building on top of Data Store, and in fact on GCP in general, is that these underlying components scale by default. Right? They encourage scalable patterns of application development. And in particular, as we'll explore when we get to the data model of rock, paper, scissors, uh, it's actually very easy to do the right thing by default. 
So to start, here's a QR code and a short URL. Go, go on. Uh, pull, oh, sorry. I, if you want to, that is. Um, you'll, you'll find that uh, a page loads with some JavaScript, and we'll actually explore the architecture in a second. Wow, sound like a submarine. Uh, and go ahead, tap it. Tap, you'll, you'll see buttons, space for your name. All right, anybody, anybody winning, losing? Not seeing anything? <sighs> this is why we can't go to Vegas together. Sorry. Um, by the way, Avalanche is the AI, in case you were not, not my name, Dan's name for it, which is kind of nice. Makes it sound like a secret agent. All right, so is somebody seeing results? Please, anyone? Okay. So this is actually what that looks like under the hood, right? Uh, the purchases, obviously, <laughs> matchmaking um, are somewhat conceptual, but in fact, uh, the rest of this is quite real. So this particular rock, paper, scissors app, which we've called Rochambeugle, um, is built on top of Cloud Endpoints, which is a serverless API management and enablement framework that builds on top of App Engine standard itself. Um, in addition to some other API gateways, but that's how we're using it here. In effect, it means that our app is actually serverless. And if you were to take a look at the source code for this particular uh, rock, paper, scissors game, you would actually see that we're using auto-generated client libraries generated by the endpoints framework itself, which is pretty cool. So that's serverless, right? So is Cloud Data Store. We hit Cloud Data Store, obviously, within App Engine itself, but we actually scale up in our data model per user and per game. So there's actually no concrete limit to how far we can scale, short of what Dan mentioned earlier with respect to the 555 rule. I think that's right, right? 555? Five. Yeah, awesome. Um, as you can see, uh, data store via a managed backup process can go easily to cloud storage, um, which would allow us to have beautiful dashboards and BigQuery. Hooray, maybe you've heard about it. And yeah. Let's take a look. The data model itself is, uh, this, this is NDB code. NDB is uh, the premier uh, app engine uh, ORM for Python, basically. It was actually uh, co-written by Guido Van Rossum when he was on the team. As you can see, we use a, a bunch of different properties here. One of the nice things about this library is that it actually lets us, uh, it, it handles the denormalization for us. So Dan talked about entity groups earlier. If we look at the user in particular, this doesn't actually, this doesn't have the user key on it, but the key itself, if you look at the, uh, the app itself, is just a string value, right? Assuming that that's actually randomly distributed, it's really easy to grow that, right? As your app grows from one user to 100 users to a million users, right? As long as each one is a, is a different string, right, or a different ID, that's the, scalable, that's the scalability unit in the underlying Megastore app itself. The game itself has the same issue uh, where it actually uses a randomly assigned integer instead. But that's all handled for us by data store under the hood. Furthermore, it's really easy. Uh, you know, consistency can be kind of a, a hairy area in distributed databases, right? One of the things that would naturally come up when you're trying to update something like a statistics property, right, is that if you're trying to increment, say, wins or losses from the result of a match, what happens if you uh, perform dirty reads, right, or dirty writes? I want to say that's the other term for it. Yeah. Um, in effect, what happens if we actually increment data um, that hasn't been committed, right, or we lose data? So NDB actually handles this, but in the process, it builds on top of the underlying cloud data store transactional framework. Because to commit the game, right, we need to update the users. So these are three discrete entities. Data Store can actually handle up to 25 entities in a transaction. Creating a transaction like that can be something of a bottleneck, but it does work well. And the semantics are actually serializable, which is kind of cool for a, you know, a NoSQL data store, right? So this is what it looks like to actually use a veneer library. The underlying thing is written in Python. This actually, sorry, veneer is our term for our REST APIs that uh, you can access in a variety of languages from Python to Go. This is using that library. As you can see, it's really simple. You assign a key. The key part, should you choose to assign it yourself, is where you need to watch for hotspotting issues, right? The other parts are the data store you've 
you know and love, uh, either from your usage of an object model or from using it on App Engine before. Getting the data out of it is just as easy. We do a query on the kind, because that's the collection, right, of the underlying entities, and we do a read from it. This is how one does it on top of the Dataflow or now Apache Beam SDK. Once we have that, we just apply that read and, well, as you can see, we have different maps and a sync. And the nice part is that data store will actually manage that sharding for us. Again, assuming that IDs have been assigned in a roughly uniform distribution, you should be good to go. And you don't have to care even when your app goes viral overnight. Endpoints is really neat, by the way. Uh, one, of the, one of the advantages of it is that should you choose to build on top of endpoints, on top of App Engine, on top of Data Store, you don't have to worry about provisioning servers ever, which is really nice because, as we all know, scale happens. Again, sometimes overnight. Finally, some kinds of data you don't want to store in Data Store. For this, we have cloud storage. Cloud storage has a CDN built in. That's really nice for if you're trying to serve a lot of things like, say, that, uh, say a configuration value that, need, that you might ordinarily store in a, in a database, but you could easily overload via a hotkey. You can store in data store instead. I'm sorry, in storage, excuse me. And it's globally distributed. And remember how we talked about splitting? Well, you can hammer this thing with a, with a key because it's a cache under the hood, right? It's a blob storage device. So you don't have to worry about overloading the underlying big table tablet the way you would in data store. Anyone having fun? I know the game's a little lame. But, it's, uh, but the thing is, if you guys are playing this right now, like, and we told everybody else in this building about it, we actually wouldn't have to do anything. I mean, we might make a couple SREs nervous. But beyond that, the underlying architecture has been proven to scale. It does millions of QPS, and we can piggyback on that for free. So with that, Thanks. here we go. Oh, you're welcome. I, I just want to make this official. Can you read out my outcomes? Draw, 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 lose. I'm really not good at this game. <laughs> Yeah, that Vegas thing, again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we already mentioned, just wanted to put the link back up there again. Um, once again, very simplistic demo, but we just wanted to give you an example. If this here just happens to get as popular as Pokemon Go, we can still be on this stage and not have to do anything. It will under, the infrastructure will do it itself. If an entire region goes down, we still don't need to do anything because it's you know, multi-region replication configuration. Uh, so if you haven't looked into it before, go to the website, Google, sorry, cloud.google.com slash data store, read up, um, play with it. We have a free tier within Cloud Data Store, so you can do 50,000 reads per day, 20,000 writes, 20,000 deletes, and a gigabyte of storage without having to pay anything. So it's a really good way to just play around and get used to it. Um, you can look on GitHub for some of those client libraries that we mentioned before. It's an, built on top of our RESTful API and our gRPC API. So you just do Google Cloud, Java, Google Cloud, Python. Look for that on GitHub, and you'll get the appropriate language. We do Python, Java, Go, Node.js, Ruby, C Sharp, and I think we have PHP now as well. Uh, we're also on Stack Overflow. You'll see myself, Will, and a bunch of other people. We'll jump on there and answer questions. Uh, and you can also hit us up on Twitter with Cloud Data Store. We occasionally have people reach out to us on there as well.